U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Laboratory. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue. Um, thanks, Ildiko. Um, well, Mark did a great job of kind of giving the, the context of avian collections as indispensable tools for answering a large variety of research questions related to evolution, conservation, biogeography, speciation. Uh, this is, my talk's the other end of the spectrum. My talk is as applied as it gets, um, but shows how avian collections are essential for answering some very small but uh, very important questions in terms of forensics. Um, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement, and we're responsible for providing scientific support uh, in terms of wildlife crime investigations. So anything that has to do with uh, bird remains that come uh, to the attention of law enforcement and, and need identification come to me uh, as the chief ornithologist at the forensics lab. We do some genetic work for identification, but really not very much in ornithology because most of the uh, bird remains we receive have morphological characters that we can use. And then uh, after I do my little bit, um, Chris will take over and talk about uh, some parallel or uh, complementary work that happens at the Smithsonian. So this is our lab. It's in beautiful Ashland, Oregon, um, far from the madhouse of DC, and we're very happy about that most of the time, except, of course, when I want to get on the metro and go look at the Smithsonian collection. Uh, just a little bit about our workload. This is the 2010 is the late last year for which uh, we've gotten compiled data, but uh, we've got about 200 special agents in the field. These are, you know, gun-toting, badge-wearing police officers, uh, and they've got a lot of training in, in wildlife biology as well. And we've got about 150 wildlife inspectors who work at airports uh, and other ports of entry around the country and do mostly uh, inspection of international shipments. In 2010, uh, these very few individuals, as you can see for the whole country, did almost 13,000 investigations, which resulted in $19 million in criminal and civil fines, prison time totaling not a whole lot, 32 years, but a lot of probation. Um, it is very hard to get the legal system to take wildlife crime seriously sometimes, unfortunately. Uh, and they processed almost 180,000 wildlife shipments uh, valued at almost $3 billion, and that was mostly legal trade. So uh, it's estimated from other sources that maybe 2% of the illegal wildlife trade is actually intercepted by law enforcement worldwide. So uh, we just are, are scraping the, the tip. Uh, so we have a number of sections at the, morpholo at the uh, forensics lab. As I said, we've got a genetic section. We have pathologists who do cause of death uh, terminations on animals chemists who do pesticide analyses and a variety of other specialties. Um, I work in morphology. This is me in a completely unposed moment, just casually going, <laughs> casually going about my business, uh, comparing a scarlet macaw specimen to uh, an artifact from South America that was intercepted by our uh, wildlife inspectors. So my work is entirely dependent on avian collections, on our reference specimen collection. Uh, the types of evidence that we get in uh, are extremely varied. Uh, if I'm very lucky, I get a whole carcass to look at. Um, that's a very good day. But a lot of times they're partial carcasses, they're decomposed. Uh, they may be oiled bird remains. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Skeletal remains, this actually is a collection of uh, the breasts of doves and woodcock that were seized from a restaurant freezer. They had the muscle on them when they were seized. Uh, I, they're delicious, of course, so I ate the mussel, and then I, <laughs> with some assistance from our domestic beetle colony, uh, and then uh, I used the, the sterna to identify the species and to confirm that they were protected species. Uh, but that was one case. Um, loose feathers, I get a lot of loose feathers. I have to do a lot of identifications based on loose feathers. We get crafted items like that headdress that you saw in the earlier slide. Uh, and sometimes I get crop contents from birds of prey that are suspected of having been poisoned, and I look at their crop contents to see if I can figure out what their last meal was. Just some more examples of evidence. Um, uh, complete carcass of a subadult bald eagle at the top. That would have probably have been submitted for cause of death determination by our veterinarians, but they also often want uh, a positive identification at the same time, even though sometimes that ID is very obvious. But uh, 
then there's a collection of hornbill skulls that came out of Africa. Again, that's one case. Um, this was material that was being imported for sale to collectors of natural history curiosity type items. Um, an oiled uh, oriole there encrusted in tar-like tar oil that has to obviously be processed before it can be identified. And sometimes there's so much evidence that I have to go uh, to where the evidence is because it's cheaper for me to go there than for them to ship everything to me. This was a big seizure in Chicago several years ago. And this is a warehouse where it was all being stored. So I'm making notes and making my identifications uh, in the field. Um, so this is just a little bit of a summary of uh, the diversity of our casework. About half of uh, my casework is in two orders of birds, the songbirds and the uh, falconiformes, or accipitriformes these days, I guess. Um, and then really just about almost every other order of bird I have seen uh, at some point in my casework. And most of you out there probably have a life list. Uh, I have a death list. I also have a life list. But, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to say my life list is quite a bit bigger than my death list. But my death list is over 550 species uh, of birds that I've identified from evidence. So it's quite a diverse range of species, very international. I get a lot of things from Asia, South America, some from Africa. Um, so it's, it's a very diverse and challenging uh, array of identification. Now this is the moment when all of uh, you, real, you real museum biologists out there get to snicker. Uh, this is our collection. It is far smaller, for example, than the house sparrow collections that we just heard about from the University of Kansas. Um, but it's primarily a synoptic collection. It's a collection with a few examples of species that we need in our casework. And for some species that we see a lot, for example, bald and golden eagles, we really have quite significant collections because, number one, we're the feds and we can have them. Uh, number two, uh, we really do need to see the, the range of variation in the plumage of those two species, which, of course, as most of you know, is very significant. Um, but we do have over 1,300 species represented. Most of the North American species are represented by at least one specimen. Um, although we still, we had some weaknesses, especially in songbirds and shorebirds, but uh, for the species that show up in casework, we, we usually are pretty well covered. About 9,000 specimens. We're, we're pretty good on complete skeletons, actually, um, skelet relatively speaking. Uh, skeletons are pretty useful in our um, oil bird work. And we've got microscopic feather mounts. Uh, I do some microscopic ID, but not nearly as much as they do at the Smithsonian, so Chris will talk about that more. And we have an artifact collection showing examples of some of these uh, objects from both either Native American type objects or uh, objects from cultures around the world that are employing feathers. Here's an example of that feather artifact collection. This is an uh, item from Brazil, and it contains the feathers of harpy eagle, blue and yellow macaw, scarlet macaw, and razorbill curacao. So I, li I like to keep a small uh, set of these uh, particularly outstanding artifacts that have um, been uh, released after successful prosecution uh, as reference material to show not only the species feathers, but also the context in which we we're likely to see them. Picking up the pace. <laughs> these are oil birds. Sometimes they get in oil, they die. It's a horrible mess, as you can see. Yuck. I have to clean them up. I clicked, I'm clicking, it's not working, I clicked, clean them up. Feathers are remarkably resilient, it turns out. They come through uh, the petroleum process very, um, very well. If you clean them up in basically a kind of carburetor cleaner kind of a thing, that's the tail feather of the thrasher. That's the skull of the thrasher that's been uh, removed from that mess. I go to my collection, I pull out what I think it might be, curved bill thrasher in this case. I make my comparison. Everybody goes, I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, we've heard two different stories here. There we go. Sure, sure. Rub it in. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we heard Mark talking about uh, use, uses for uh, uh, collections for research, and Pepper talking about the the criminal work. I'm going to kind of do a combination of the two using a scientific research collection to do non-criminal forensics. Uh, and so we have a team of folks at the Smithsonian, uh, the, the Feather Lab, affectionately known as the FLAB. Uh, there's 
for them in that lab, and they do a, a primarily a combination of work using whole feather ID, uh, microscopic feather structure, and also uh, DNA barcoding, which I'll talk about in a bit. Oops. So we do some uh, interdepartmental work using uh, the, uh, our feather experts to identify feathers in anthropological uh, collections for uh, you know things that might have cultural significance. Uh, we, we they they ask us to come over and, and help them out without with that kind of work quite a bit. Um, also now, feathers and amber. There's uh, some recent work being done with this. Uh, it's been in some. Uh, I think there was an article in Science recently where people are trying to figure out if uh, whole uh, dinosaur feathers maybe have been preserved in amber, and so uh, we're being called in and to uh, to help with that as well. Uh, this feather in particular. It's hard time. It's, we have a hard time doing anything with it. Um, this one because there's no downy barbules, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's so important later. Uh, we also help out with National Park Service, who've been trying to uh, work on the Burmese python problem down in the Everglades. Uh, Skip Snow here has been extracting uh, stomach contents from these pythons, sending all the, the remains to us, and we've been going through and. and picking out what we can find. We have found 25 species so far, everything from uh, house wrens to wood storks. Uh, sometimes that kind of material comes in, it's just little small pieces of bone. Uh, we do have a great collection for this kind of work because we do have very large skeleton collection, very large fluid collection, very large tissue collection, and, uh, and in this case, you know, we just had a small fragment of a piece of bone and we're able to identify that as a great blue heron. Similar situation this time with a whole skull. By using uh, skulls from the known species of bird in that area, we were able to, to make a match here with this one for Sora. Uh, but the real bread and butter of this program is uh, working with bird strikes. So uh, bird strikes cause about $5 billion worth of damage annually uh, all over the world. And so this, uh, the, the program receives in over 6,000 bird strikes every year. Uh, using This is an interagency cooperation between the, uh, the D Department of Defense, uh, military, uh, and the FAA. Uh, the FAA does not require bird strikes be sent in, but the military does. So they, we, we do quite a lot of military work. And we only do FAA work uh, when it's something that is damaging. And so these are the kinds of materials that we, uh, they send to us, either whole or partial carcasses. Uh, whole feathers is primarily what we get. Uh, sometimes little swabs uh, using either the little uh, cotton swab or the uh, FTA cards. Uh, they send some DNA samples that way. Or the bottom picture uh, is just a bag of ick we like to call snarge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a very important tool for this kind of work. Uh, and, and it uh, Pepper talked about a lot of whole feather work, but we do a lot of microscopic uh, work. And this is our microslide collection. We have over 4,000 uh, slides covering all the orders and uh, all the families of birds and most of the genera. Uh, and we do that with the downy part of the feather. The pumulaceous part is the, is the real is the real important part. The pinaceous part is just uh, hooks, and it's pretty much the same across all feathers. But the, the downy part is really where it's at for, for trying to figure out what birds are. Uh, and we can actually identify things to, um, to order by looking at the, uh, the different structures on the, on the, on the uh, barbules. And so you see, uh, when you start looking at this under a microscope, you start to see all these different shapes and, and uh, pigments and, and villi and all these little different things that actually tell you what these things are. And so uh, the location of the nodes is very important to this. Sometimes they're proximal, sometimes they're distal. And um, also the, uh, the pigment distribution, whether it's, it's the whole node or, or, or one end of the node or, or wherever it might be. Uh, and so after you look at this quite a lot, you start to realize that there was all these differences in those, in those feathers. And so if you look at a quail, you'll see it has this, this round disc shape. And so whenever you look at that and under a microscope, it's really easy to figure out what it was. Uh, same thing with ducks. Ducks have a very unique sort of triangle shape there. Um, the other thing that we use a lot is now is barcoding. Since, um, uh, the Feather Lab was, was really instrumental in setting up the, uh, the DNA barcoding system for, um, for North America. 
uh, started that way. We started with just the birds in North America, and now we've been uh, working to, to include birds from all over the world. And um, it's been quite useful. We have a full-time tech now, uh, Farida, who is doing uh, uh, about 40 percent of the cases we receive we're actually doing DNA barcoding on now and, and getting our IDs that way. So uh, we have over 35,000 tissues in our collection, and we've uh, barcoded over 2,000 species just from our collection alone. Uh, and the Barcode of Life database, bold, uh, has over 4,000 uh, 4, species now and over 30,000 uh, vouchered specimens on that database. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about how that works. Barcode of Life, this is just sort of the front screen that you get when you go to that data set, and you extract your CO1 gene and you just uh, cut and paste your sequence right into the, into the search engine here. And it will actually come back, spit out this page to you, and tell you what your sample is. And you know, when we get some of these bird strike samples that are just a little s blood smear, we're actually able to get DNA out of that little tiny uh, fragment of blood off of those swabs and uh, run it through bold and, and get matches that way. These used to be just listed as unknown you know, in the bird strike database. Now we're actually able to get 100% uh, IDs on those, which is really great. And so, uh, so the last thing here I want to talk about also, we sometimes get high profile cases as well. Uh, this is, uh, everybody sh I'm sure remembers Flight 1549 that went into the Hudson. Uh, we were uh, heavily involved in, in, in figuring out what went wrong in that case because this was a bird strike. Uh, and we were asked to, to not only figure out the ID, which wasn't too difficult, but uh, also try to figure out whether how many individual birds were involved, because a, a bird uh, is not supposed to be able to take down a big plane like that. A single bird isn't. Uh, and so they also wanted to know if it was uh, resident or migratory, uh, because that's a big issue up there for them. And so in order to try to do that, we, we used a couple different techniques. One was to uh, get samples from both engines. Turn, there, there were uh, bird strikes into both engines. Uh, so we did uh, sexing, DNA sexing, to figure out whether there were multiple sexes in one engine. So it turns out one engine had male and female DNA in it. The other engine just had female. So we knew there was at least three birds that uh, took that plane down. And then in order to try to figure out whether it was migratory or res resident, we uh, looked at isotopes. And so by, uh, by getting some of the feather samples from the engine, running uh, hydrogen isotope analysis on it, we were able to determine that these birds had come from pretty far up north, and so they were migratory and not the resident Canada geese. And so um, that's about all I have. How are we doing we're on time? Way over. Way over? Okay. <laughs>